All right. Let's look at the uh, cyclohexanes again. We'll start. Um, we'll start with these, and then we're gonna we're gonna look some more at chirality, and then we're gonna start talking about our, our last big topic before the midterm. Um, so midterms a week from week from today. Um, so next week we won't have lab; it'll be review session. Um, but we probably will still have enough material to lecture through most of Tuesday. Um, and then when we get through the material we'll and lecture, and then the rest of the day on Tuesday will be office hours. Basically, I'd come ask me questions if you have questions on the practice test, um, which should be available today, I believe. I'll double check that the, that it's published, but there, there's just a homework assignment on Canvas that has a PDF attached to it. If you want a uh, physical copy, just follow me down to my office and I'll print some physical copies after after lecture. Um, and everything, you know, it's, well, I won't spend too much time talking about that now. We'll talk about that next week when you've had a chance to look at it. But, um, the last big topic that we have to cover before then is something we've already talked about a fair bit, which is potential energy surfaces and, and whether reactions spontaneous or downhill at energy. So we've been hinting at that for a while now. Um, but that's our last big target. It's like, okay, here's your potential energy surface. Is this reaction spontaneous at room temperature? If you have delta H and delta S, what, what temperature does it become spontaneous? Remembering how to use those del that delta G equation again. So um, the same K equals E to the negative delta G or a different one? It's the same, that equation, but then there's also the, so equilibrium curve. Equilibrium constant, it's E to the minus delta G over RT. Um, and then reminder that delta G has its own definitions, that enthalpy minus temperature times the entropy change. So remember, enthalpy is our energy and chemical bonds, and entropy is our disorder. So for organic chemistry, a lot of times delta S is not that large okay. because we frequently wind up with the same number of molecules before and after. And that's the number one driver of, of entropy change is if we increased the number of molecules. So that's relatively constant in what we're going to be dealing with. And a lot of times our delta S doesn't is not that significant of a factor. It's more delta H because that's the actual we're breaking unstable chemical bonds and making more stable chemical bonds typically. Um, however, in, in reactions where delta S is significant, that temperature winds up playing a big role because the bigger temperature gets, the more this whole section matters. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about rate constants, or reminder, or a review of capital K as our equilibrium constant, lowercase k, which I always indicate the cursive k, um, is our um, rate constant. It's got the same general formula as our um, equilibrium constant, except it's our activation energy over RT. And so our rate of our reaction is also dependent on both the potential energy surface and the temperature, just like our equilibrium is as well. So that's the last big topic, and we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but we're basically going to start applying this to here's the potential energy surface with multiple steps. What's the slow step? What's the fast step? What's favored at equilibrium? Is this overall process spontaneous? Questions like that. Then you look at the practice test, that's the whole last page, maybe the last page and a half, um, is gonna be like, interpret this, this potential energy surface with these ideas. Um, this uh, activation energy, that's the same as delta E, just for the... Yeah, we, we typically call it E sub A, or um, you can also see it labeled as uh, delta E double dagger, mm. um, which is this weird typographical symbol that literally looks like like two daggers. If you think of that as like a little sword pointed downward, and then if you do another one, pointed upward, they call this symbol double dagger, but that's really hard to draw by hand. And so frequently just see it as um, a line. Kind of, it's more like, I, I missed up on that one. It's more like a vertical line 
It's a uh, lowercase t that you crossed twice down here. Um, so that is the more accurate symbol because this symbol means at a transition state where you're at a local maximum um, for on the potential energy surface. But a lot of times just for shorthand, we'll just say activation energy because then that gets around, is it really delta H or is it delta E or is it delta G? We just use the generic term for rates, activation energy, because it's right. really like a combination of several different things. Yeah, because I've seen this before. I wasn't sure if it was any different than so. Yeah, it's, it's that's the, the difference is technically it's delta H has to be at an isobaric process, meaning at a constant pressure. Um, and if you if it's not at a constant pressure, then you can't call it delta H. There's some weird definitions that when you get into PCHEM uh, in upper division, when you start doing multivariable calculus and deriving some of these things from, from scratch, you start seeing some of these weirdnesses. Um, and that's why they tend to be kind of picky with, with how we write energy terms. Gotcha. Technically, if it's a closed system, it's not isobaric, you can't call it delta H, but we still frequently do because it's easier. There's like even certain variables constantly. Exactly, exactly. For the, um, how much math have you had, David? Okay, well, I got okay. like theoretical linear algebra, but that was like okay. So you took a multivariable count. Yeah. So technique one of the de the derivations for delta H as is this is it the partial uh, partial of volume with respect to temperature at a constant pressure. You wind up, if you take all these different partials of gases, you wind up with our derivations of delta H or enthalpy actually coming from gas laws originally. Um, and that's why they have these isobaric requirements in there. So it's basically, if you keep a constant pressure, think about a piston, if you keep a constant pressure, so it's pushing against the atmospheric pressure, but you increase the temperature, the volume should increase. And when you do that, it does work because you're pushing against the constant pressure. And from that, down the line, you wind up able to derive these, um, these relationships to enthalpy. So all that's beyond what we're gonna do for this class, but <laughs> you're asking the right questions to get me going on it. Um, let me, let and me clear all this. We have great interest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and you're just at the border of what I remember when you asked that question. Like, I remember doing those partials and not liking them or understanding them. And I remember they were related to enthalpy. And that's about as far as my memory goes. <laughs> um, all right. So let's look at these cyclohexanes. We have two different possibilities. These are one, two dimethyls. They're one, three dimethyls, which means we have a different real sacred cell. Um, if we have one three dimethyl cis versus trans, which of them is going to have the more stable complement? So try drawing the um, the chair compromers for both of these and figure out which one, which of these isomers allows us to put both of the substituents in the equatorial position. Cis, you can put them both in the axial pretty easily when it's when it's um, drawn on the chair conformer, right? Because remember, our axial versus equatorial alternate. Our axial goes up, then the next axial position goes down, then the next axial position goes up. So for both of these, we wind up putting um, putting our substituents in the axial position, which means when we when we do the chair flip. We should wind up with methyl in the equatorial position. And this is in that difficult spot to draw equatorial position. 
So A lets us put them both in the equatorial position, which should be the most stable compromise. Versus B, if we've done A, we know that, and we can, for A, we can put them both equatorial. We know we can't do that for B, right? Because if we're in the cis position now, I'm just gonna amend this one rather than redraw everything. We're starting with one axial, one equatorial. So when we do a chair flip, we get one axial, one equatorial. So B has two conformers that are both equally stable. So at least we would have a, a symmetric potential energy surface if when we do these chair flips. A, on the other hand, is, is not symmetrical, but it has going to have one conformer that's very heavily favored because both of our methyls are equatorial. And they're in the one three position, right? One three is where we get those diaxial interactions. When you put them in one three, then the size of your substituents matters even more than it normally would because when they're both axial, they're actively bumping into each other, not just the other hydrogens. So if the question was to ask, which of the two molecules below has the least stable and most stable conformer of those both be A? The least stable and the most stable conformer are both A. Okay. Let's do it one more time. Let's do it, try substituting. I'll give you a minute. It will be the cis one. So when they were when they were all cis before and they were alternating one, three, five, we were able to get them all equatorial at the same time. And so we'll see this should see the same thing for B. Let's draw it for A first so we can confirm that. So for A. Two of them are above the plane, and one is below the plane. So our axial position in this on carbon five here would be going straight up like that, right? That would be if, if all three of them were six. That's not what we have though. And again, I like to draw these, um, I place the axials first and then put the equatorials where the axials aren't, basically, as a way to, to visually see um, the cis versus the trans. It's easier to see the axials because the axials are very obviously either cis or trans. And the equatorials are a lot harder to visualize. So start by putting the axials on there first. So in this case, for A, we get a molecule where we have two axial and one equatorial, which means when we when we do our chair flip, we should get oops, still have the eraser on there. We should get one equatorial, two equatorial, but the other one axial. And we just showed that we had all three of them starting axial because it's one, three, five trimethyl. Then our starting conformer that we started with would be all of them being axial, which means when we do a chair flip, B is going to give us the ability to have all of them be equatorial. <coughs> all right, so no matter what the substituents are, the only thing that could make this more complicated um, than what we just did is if they're not all the same size. If they're not all the same size, then it's not just a matter of counting axials or equatorials, it's a matter of putting the largest substituent 
in the equatorial position. And there is some gray area there where there's crossover. Two methyls versus one bromine. If our choice was two methyls can be equatorial, but that makes our bromine axial, which of those is favored? That's a gray area. I would have to look up the numbers. Um, so I won't, I'm not going to test you on those. It should be pretty obvious. It'll either be either just two substituents if there's a ch change in size, or it'll be all the same substituents. And all you have to do is look at how many axial versus how many equatorial. I want you aware of those other concepts, yeah. but I'm not going to test you on them on the closed book of the test. All right, so we're feeling pretty good about cyclohexane conformers. Getting there anyway, as long as I'm the one up here with the blank board. <laughs> All right, let's do a little bit of, of um, nomenclature review. And then we'll start talking about chirality. So this one, we just added our new wrinkle for cyclo groups, if we have, but we've been using the terminology a lot. So it should be pretty straightforward. Start with the parent molecule, then add the prefixes that you need, right? So cyclopentane. And it's cyclopentane with two methyl groups. So it's dimethyl cyclopentane. Cis, one, two, cis, right? One, cis, one, two. Put the one, two first. And then cis, I sometimes write, write the, that's what happens when I try to write and talk at the same time. Um, sometimes I'll put cis in parentheses if I'm doing it, if I'm writing stuff out by hand. Um, typically, the officially correct formatting um, for typing this is you put cis as italicized, um, but that's, I'm not gonna write in cursive because I don't remember how to write in cursive, so. Uh, putting in parentheses is good enough for handwriting. All right, and just a reminder, anytime you say die anything, you've got to have two numbers. Right? Even if they're on the same carbon, if it was one, one dimethyl, we still got to specify where both of those methyl groups are. And then applying the same language to alkenes, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on how to name alkenes, but I, I did mention that all we're doing is we just specify where the double bond is with the locant, with the number. And then uh, instead of ending in ane, it's ending in ene, E N E. So our parent molecule in here would be one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So hex in we just have to specify where that double bond is by just putting a number in front of the parent molecule. So this is between carbons two and three, so we say it's two hexene. We always just use one number for the alkenes um, because it has to be between two adjacent carbons. So you just say whatever the lower number is, and it's implied that if it's two hexene, that the double bond is between carbons two and three. Would it always be bound to the higher order of carbon? I guess you know. You like rephrase. I you know, like always. I, I, I'm going to just not ask that question because it's think, think too about the word. It's too certain. Okay, yeah. Um, the only other thing we have to think about here is our cis versus our trans isomers, right? Alkenes are restricted rotations, just like ring structures are. So we need to specify that, and it can be helpful to visualize the other substituents here. Our, our carbon chain, our primary carbon chain is bound across the alkene, not on the same side, the alkene. So this would be an example of a trans isomer, trans to hexene. Um, sometimes you'll also see it putting the two in front of the hex, 
the whole thing is the more traditional way. I lately, and I say lately, but in like in the last 10 years, IUPAC has started recommending that you put these numbers embedded in the parent molecule. So instead of two hexene, you could say hex two ene. That's technically more correct, but it doesn't roll off the tongue as well. Um, so either of these will be accepted. This really shows up more when we start having multiple functional groups that we indicate with the suffix. For instance, if we had an OH here, that's a hexene all. And so we could do, say, hex2, hex4, 2, e for all allows you to very explicitly state that the alkene is between carbons two and three and that the alcohol is, is on carbon four. So this doing it this way is, is kind of like using the parentheses instead of saying isopropyl. Um, it's more powerful, it, but it's a little bit less easy to say. And it's, it, um, the, the most technically correct, not necessarily in everyday use as much. The other thing that we'll talk about here is basically that cis versus trans with alkenes winds up being kind of tricky because you can actually, the cis versus trans is referring to where does the primary carbon chain go? There's another naming system that gets used that's a little bit more universal rather than cis and trans where you look at we do what's called assigning priority and by assigning priority we basically look at both sides of the molecule here so i'm just taking this and rotating it so we've got a methyl up and then that would be a propyl and then we have these hydrogens here right we basically assign the assigned priority to each of these sides based on atomic number. Whatever has the higher atomic number, and actually, let me, instead of using the abbreviations, this will make more sense if I actually show the complete structure here. So, are you also saying you need higher product protons to be able to change? Not quite. That's why I wanted to show this. It's right. not just looking at the molecular weight of the chain. It's specifically the atom that is directly attached. Which of those has the higher atomic number? And so basically, we're going to compare this substituent to this substituent to say which is the higher priority. And when it's carbon, when it's a methyl group versus a hydrogen, it's pretty easy to see. But basically, you say, OK, well, attached to my alkene, I've got a carbon and directly attached on the side, I also have a hydrogen. Which of them has the higher atomic number? It's gonna be carbon, right? So we'd say that this is our higher priority. And then on the other side, we do the same exact thing. We compare this substituent to this substituent. And just looking at what the, the atom that's directly attached to the alkene, and which of those two atoms has the higher atomic number? So in, in this case, again, we, we have a carbon versus a hydrogen. So here's our higher priority on this side. So because our higher priorities are on opposite sides, it's the same logic that we use to say that it's trans, but the terminology if you're using this priority system is to call it, um, make sure I don't say it wrong the first time, Antigagan E, we just call it E instead of writing out trans. So we would say it's, and this one is traditionally done in parentheses, not italics. So it'd be E to hexene. E stand is for the German word Antigagan that I said, which literally means against, like, the, like antagonist. It's the same root as antagonist, right? So Antigagan means they're pointed in the opposite directions. What's the uh, German for cis? <laughs> Zusamen, <laughs> which, which is literally the same. Okay. Um, that's easy, that's easy. Despite the fact that it comes from German, the easy way to remember it is 
is what well, it's kind of it kind of is like cis and also the um Zeus, Zeus or Zeus Zeus um if you it's even though it comes from the German if you put on a bad French accent Z is for the same side <laughs> what I saw some video when I first learned this and that was what was recommended so I avoid saying that too many times, but that is something that you can stick with you now. <laughs> C is for this same side, and E is the other one. E is N. I, I like to go back to the German once you get that down into Gagan versus Asaman. Uh, it's not that tricky to remember. Uh, but this priority system, where it can differ, is in if we had something besides a hydrogen here, if we had an OH here, then all of a sudden our primary carbon chain is trans, but oxygen has a higher atomic number than carbon. So you can wind up cis and trans don't map exactly to E and Z, because E and Z is based on atomic number, and cis and trans is based on the carbon chain. And so usually they will be the same, but you can have instances where they're not. They will always be the same for hydrocarbons. They're all, they will always be the same for hydrocarbons. You got me second guessing because I said always again. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, believe that, I believe that that will be the case. If it's not, then there's a better way to count your, your carbons. The only time it could be different is if there was a complicated branch. Um, but it would have to be a complicated branch that's the same length as the main carbon chain, in which case you could just count the other direction. Gotcha. So I think I can say that. That's fine, fine uncertainties. <laughs> yeah, there, it turns out that there's more certainties in the nomenclature than there are in the properties, because the nomenclature has, has you know, mathematical, um, you know, logical dependencies that you can say always when it comes to naming things. You can't do that as soon as we get involved in energies and things <laughs> like that, because there's always an exception. There it is. There it is. <laughs> you just said always. Always an exception. <laughs> uh, all right, so we use the same priority system to name our enantiomers. Remember, enantiomers were our, were our stereoisomers where the, you had a non-superimposable mirror image. Right, and so we, the way we're going to name these is basically you assign priority to all four substituents instead of just comparing two against each other on one side and two against each other on the other side. We we number them one through four. All right, and so this is just a placeholder molecule for the sake of showing this figure. So if we went around and we assigned priority based on atomic number. We said, okay, the red is first priority, then blue, then yellow, then, then green. If once we assign the priority, we take that molecule and we're going to rotate it so that number four is pointed into the board away from us. Right, which, you know, if we're used to drawing all the If we're used to drawing our, our uh, tetrahedral geometries, like this, it doesn't matter what those substituents are once we assign priority to them. So now all we have to do is we have to take this molecule and we want to spin it around so that number four is pointed in towards the back where number three is, but we can't just swap three and four because this is a three dimensional object. If we just swap, swap three and four, we would have to break a bond to do that. So what we do instead is we just take it and we, we visualize spinning it around. And there's a lot of different ways you could do this. With well, the way I typically re recommend doing it is to treat, treat this, this like a fan, like a, just a regular blade, fan blade. Um, you're going to keep one of the substituents the same and then rotate the other three like the blades of a fan. And so in this case, you could either take both number one constant or number two constant. Only number one constant might be harder to visualize, but if you, and then 
Remember using our three fingers to represent three substituents on a tetrahedral shape? So if I'm gonna, let's say, let's say I'm gonna hold number two constants. Number two is my elbow. My hand is the chirocarbon that makes my thumb our, our lowest priority substituent, right? This goes back to you, you might want to like write one, two, three on your on your fingernails for the test. You hold your hand like this. If number four is my thumb, if I want number four to go backwards, I have to rotate for three towards us, and then two, or sorry, and then and sorry, we're here. So that's going to put number one out towards us, number three up, and number four back. All right, so just take this and twist it, hold these two in the same spot. Basically, you need to rotate all three of these. You just need to do it in a consistent way. So when you rotate that, so if we're holding number two constant, a lot of times we'll write an arrow like this to indicate we're showing it rotating around this bond. So then we'll still get two here. One's gonna rotate forward, four is rotating back, three is rotating up. All right, everybody with me on that one? Again, easy enough when I'm the one doing it. You can do it just as easily with uh, the one, right? Yeah, or if you hold one constant, then you're twisting it like this. Right, that should give you the same answer. And also, you could have three correct answers here because the one could start in any where one, two, three is, and they just go clockwise. As long right. as one, two, three, right? Yeah, you could. Yeah, we could do something. We just need. We could hold three constant and rotate one, two, and four. Now we can't hold three constant because we need four to be where three is. Yeah, that's right. So we could hold either of the other two constants. Once we do that, once four is in the back, we ignore it. And we just count one to two to three. And we draw an error. One to two to three. If the arrow is going clockwise, that's an R configuration. If we count one to two to three and the arrow is going counterclockwise, we name that as S. And no matter how you do this one, it's always going to be. It should, you should get R no matter which of those rotations you did. You should get R. I'm going to try to stop using the arrow. Sorry. <laughs> the other way that you can do this, if four is pointed directly towards us, and so I'm if the rotating it way makes sense to you, if you can visualize that, then you can stick with that. If that's really tricky for you, you might want to try visualizing it another way, which is, okay, if this is a three-dimensional object, what if I just stepped behind the board and I looked at it from behind the ball here? Then everything would be flipped and four would be pointed away from me, right? And if you do that, if you... Physically, it helps if you can actually physically turn, at least for me. You one to two to three, it still should go clockwise if you turn around and visualize it from being behind the board. Right? So if I just connected one to two to three here, it looks like it would be counterclockwise, right? But if I'm visualizing that red arrow from behind the board, it's clockwise. So when four is stuck directly out at you, you can leave it where it is and look at it from behind. Would a Newman projection be able to tell you the same thing? Um, you could get to that information. I think you're introducing a lot of places to mix yourself up by doing that. Yeah. Especially since once we get the priority assigned, we don't care what the rest of the molecule looks like. Yeah. We only care about one to two, get four in the back and then count one, two, three. And so then if we took, this is just showing 
<laughs> this is showing the other rotation. We keep one constant and rotate two, three, and four. We wind up with four going into the board. Two comes forward. Three goes where two was. So this this rotation is we're rotating around that axis and keeping one in the same spot. But again, once we do that, four is in the back, draw an arrow one to two to three, it's still clockwise, right? So that's the whole point of this procedure is that you get the right handedness for the molecule, regardless of what rotation you do. When I say handedness, I mean, which enantiomer is, is your right, they call it handedness because it's like your right hand and your left hand being different from each other or the right side of the car being different from the left hand of the car. So let's practice. Two of these are already drawn in the easy tetrahedral way for you. The second one, you're going to have to draw it out yourself, draw all the substituents and assign priority. And remember, I guess we didn't talk about any ties yet. If you have a tie for your priority, you go to the next atom out. You pick the, you pick which direction you're headed in a way that gets you to the next heaviest atom in a row. Right. So if you have for this one, we have a carbon and then another hydrogen. For this one, we have a carbon and then it's an isopropyl group. So we have a hydrogen, but then we also have two other metals. So starting with our asymmetric center, so carbon and carbon tie. Take another step out and we get another carbon or a hydrogen. Another carbon is higher priority. And so all of these start by going to another carbon. And then after on the next step, Two of them go to another carbon after that. The isopropyl and the ethyl group both go to another carbon. Our highest atomic number attached here is the bromine. So this would be our highest priority. This would be our lowest priority. And then we have to decide between an ethyl group and an isopropyl group. Why? It looks more complicated. <laughs> I mean, just because the steric forces would be different than that of just a yeah. So good, and you're you're correct. This is the higher priority. The way we actually do it with this process is okay. We went one step was a carbon, second step was a carbon, third step for both of them is a hydrogen. We hit the end of the carbon chain, right? So then again, then we go back to the asymmetric center and we do it again. But you have to choose a different path this time. The ethyl group still goes carbon, then another carbon, then, then another hydrogen, no matter what you do, right? But this one, you can go carbon, then a different carbon, right? So the fact that there's two carbons attached here means that it's going to win our, our tiebreaker. When we have to go a different pathway, we still have another carbon we can go to. This ethyl group doesn't have another carbon it can go to. So our ethyl is going to be three on our priority list. And here's two. And then once you have that, it can be helpful since that's a mess, right? Especially since I was drawing all over everything. Just go and rewrite it. We've got one coming out down to the right now towards us. There's three. Here's two, and here's four. And now it looks the same as our last example, right? Once we get our priority assigned, yeah, the numbers are in different spots, but it's the same problem every time now. Rotate it to get number four into the back. The trickiest part by far of these problems is being consistent is assigning priority and then being consistent with the rotation. Everybody knows how to tell clockwise from counterclockwise. I'm not worried about that. Assigning
assigning priority is tricky, and then doing the rotations is tricky. So what could we, how should we rotate this one? One to three, three to four, four to one. Yeah, I usually find it easier mentally to hold one of the two bonds that I'm, one of the ones I'm gonna hold constant is going to be one of the bonds that's in the plane. I just find that easier to visualize. So I can't hold four constants, so I'm gonna hold two constant. So now I've got four is my thumb, one is my pointer, three is my middle finger. When I take these and rotate them, what was one is now where four was. And so our rotation then is gonna look like two is still in the same spot, four is back, three came forward and one is over here. took all of these and twisted them. That's R. And so now we can look at it. If I remember this correctly, I think that uh, we do a whole bunch of examples that all wind up being R. Um, and that's not on purpose. It's not R is not favored. Um, energetically, R versus S are identical to each other. They have some slightly different properties from each other, though, in terms of um, how they rotate polarized light. Turns out um, chiral materials, you shine polarized light on them, it rotates the plane of the polarized light of the magnetic field generated by the photons. The polarized light has all, let's say we had a polarization filter, so that filtered it out so that all light um, the magnetic field was going up and down vertically. When you pass that through a chiral material, it rotates the plane of the light. And it ro they rotate in opposite directions, depending on if it's R versus S. So if I pass it through an R material, it might rotate this way. If I pass it through an S material, it might rotate the other way. However, R and S doesn't tell you which direction it's going to be. Just because we count it clockwise doesn't mean it rotates light clockwise. Because counting clockwise with our priority is sort of an abstraction that allows us to classify things. It's not actually the physical molecule itself has anything to do with that. Um, so it's slightly different, which is why if you've ever heard of um, amino acids are one of the most common examples of a chiral material. All amino acids, except for glycine, rotate light to the right when you pass through them. But that doesn't mean that they're all R. Um, and that's just because of all amino acids other than glycine have an asymmetric center, have a chiral carbon. And for whatever reason, when, when life was, when, you know, the first protocells um, were starting to develop and proteins were starting to become a thing, um, you know, basically a very, very early cell kicked at random out of these two in the, you know, quote unquote, primordial soup that would have been present on earth before life there would have probably would have been an equal amount of R versus S amino acids. But, for, but that gave us, would give us too much flexibility. And you can't use an R methionine in place of an S methionine because they're backwards. That'd be like trying to fit your right hand into your left handed glove. So basically an early cell basically picked at random, 50-50 shot. And we happen now to have all life based on D amino acids, meaning that they rotate light clockwise. Um, could have just as very, just as easily been the opposite. Um, as far as we're aware, there's no difference energetically between the two enantiomers. It just happened to be the cell that took off and became the earliest ancestor for all life happened to pick one of these sets of stereoisomers instead of the other one. All right, so we got another R here. All of that just to say R and S are 
functionally identical with a few weird properties with the, is how we know they're actually separate molecules, separate compounds. Um, scent is another one. So because scent works by having a three-dimensional shape or you know keyhole basically in your proteins in your smell receptors, um, the mirror image won't fit into that same receptor site the same way. The same way as if you took a mirror image of your key, it wouldn't fit into the same keyhole because like the grooves would be on the wrong side of the key now, right? Even if parts of the key are the same, it's not three-dimensionally the same, it's backwards. Scent does the same thing. Scent is basically our body's way of trying to, to categorize three-dimensional shapes of molecules in a way that helps us survive by not eating things that are dangerous to us. Um, and so the right-handed version of a molecule will smell different than the left-handed version of the same molecule. And the classic example that was on the end of the slides from Tuesday is a molecule called carbone. Um, one of the one of the stereoisomers of carbone is the scent of spearmint. The other one is the scent of caraway. It's not even related molecules, um, but they wind up having very very different scents to us, even though they look identical practically. All the only difference is one's R versus one's S, but they hit our scent receptors different scent receptors because of that three-dimensional shape being backwards. All right. Let's practice this second one because this is the one that's going to require us to redraw it first. We can assign priority before we start redrawing, but it can be helpful also in terms of assigning priority. So start by redrawing it. And it it can be in the same positioning. We don't need to rotate this molecule yet. So you start by saying, okay, there's our chiral carbon. Then it's going to have one, one, two, three. So a propyl group. One, two, three. And then a chlorine group in the same direction as the hydrogen, or as the chlorine is our hydrogen, but pointing out towards us. And then we had a metal group down into the right. So in terms of assigning priority, two of them are easy. One and four are easy to assign here, right? What's the lowest priority? What's our highest priority? Or the only one, so chlorine is a much higher atomic number than carbon, right? So we get our highest priority, chlorine. Then we've got a propyl group versus a methyl group. The propyl. And so now, if you cleaned it up a little bit, Or just redraw it. So this is oriented differently than the way we've been looking at them, but it's still no different. It's still a three-dimensional object. We can treat it like a band blade where we're going to keep one thing constant and then rotate the other three. So if we're going to try to put four where one is, we can either keep three constant or we can keep two constants because I'm Writing with my right hand and gesturing with my left, I'm going to keep two constant because that allows us to do this for the positioning. I can use either of my hands to do this, though, right? So four is my index finger. To rotate that back means one goes where three is, three sticks out. Two didn't move. As I suspected, we get another R. There would be nothing different about the, 
this if it was an S, we would just our final arrow would be drawn the other direction if it was S. But because this arrow one to two to three goes clockwise, it's another R bigger or complement. Not complement, isomer. All right, so how do we write the name for these? Just like we did with the cis and the trans or the E and the Z, we just throw R in front of it, name the rest of the molecule as normal. So this is going to be pentane, right? Two chloro. Two chloro. Pentane. And then we just specify that it's R in parentheses. And as usual, I'm up against the edge of the board here. R, make sure that I'm writing an R there. <laughs> In parentheses. So R to chloropentane. The one thing you were trying to write down. <laughs> yeah, right to the edge. We'll start with the right now. So R to chloropentane. All right, so we'll take a break here in a minute, but I just wanted to show you where the or where this shows up on the practice test. Great, it's not on here. Let's see if this is what I'm looking for. This has the right format, or if I adjusted it after that. Yeah. So basically, there where it can show up is naming them. Just make sure if you see a stereo center that you have a the name it R versus S. And then the other places for each pair of molecules below indicated they're enantiomers, diastereomers, constitutional isomers, or the same molecule. If they're the same molecule, a lot of times that means it, it looks like it could be an enantiomer, but if you wind up giving it the same um, designation both times, you look at it like, oh, that one's R, this one's also R, then it's actually the same molecule. Right, so it's technically, it's multiple choice. Some of these are easier to rule out than others. And we'll, we'll define their diastereomers. Um, like for this one, for instance, it's really obvious this is not an enantiomer because here we have one four dimethyl cyclohexane. Here we have one three dimethyl. If you have to change the numbers, then it's a constitutional isomer. We don't have them. It's not just a mirror image. We actually had to attach the atoms on a different carbon. This molecule looks like the way it's drawn with the wedges and the dashes looks like it might have stereochemistry, right? It might have an R versus an S. It looks like it would be an enantiomer, except which of these would have higher priority? They're the same. So does it actually have an enantiomer? If you have, you need, in order for it to have an enantiomer, you need four distinct objects attached to that carbon, right? Those methyl group, or those two ethyl groups being identical means that it's not a chiral carbon. So that's the diastereomer. That's not even, that's the same molecule. Because if you look, picture taking this and flipping it over like a pancake, you get the same thing, right? Because these two are, are identical to each other, we can't tell the difference when we rotate them around. So that makes it the same molecule. And then the last piece is if it's a, a if it has a stereo center, but not a but the two molecules are not superimposable mirror images, it's a diastereomer. It basically means that it's um, the two common ways that we see diastereomers are either cis trans isomers. Those are not mirror images of each other, but they're also not the same molecule. Um, or if you have two stereocenters on the same molecule, if one of them, if you take the mirror image of one of them, but not the other, 
these two molecules are not mirror images of each other, right? But they're also not the same molecule. And they're also not constitutional isomers because the chlorines are still attached to carbon two and four. If this one is R and R, this one is R and S. Because we didn't put both of them, it's not an enantiomer. For it to be an enantiomer, yet you would have to flip both of these, which is what we see here. Both this molecule has two stereocenters as well, right? And between these two um, depictions, both of those stereocenters got flipped. Here, only one of them got flipped. That's your dead giveaway for a diastereomer. If only one of your two stereocenters changes, then it's not a true mirror image. This would be the same molecule on the left? No, those are enantiomers. Why can't you just flip that like a pancake? So picture what happens when you do that. You wind up with, if you flip this one like a pancake, this one that was sticking up is now sticking down. Oh. I see. Right? Versus in same same way, if this one's sticking down and then you flip it like a pancake, now it's over here sticking up. Gotcha. So you swap these two positions, but it doesn't make it look like that one. So two stereo centers that are, that are both flipped is an enantiomer. Two stereo centers where one of them is flipped is diastereomers. With the dichloropentane, though, if you flipped both of the stereo centers and then wouldn't that just make it then the same molecule? Not quite. Well, on that one? Because they so if we assign our priority here, I have to use the other notation here, which is a little bit glitchy. I don't like it as much as Excel's. If we assign our priority, we get one. One, two, three, and four is the hydrogen that's already in the back, right? And same priority here, but flipped. So this one would be R, this one would be S. Over here, this one's still R, but now our lowest priority is pointing out towards us. And when we wind up rotating that around, we wind up seeing this one is also R. If we made it, if we flipped both of them, this one was RS, the other, next, if we flipped it again, it'd be SR. So we're hitting on, on another point, um, which you're right, I did give, this is a meso compound, compound, the one on the left is. If you take the mirror image of both of these, because it has, we call an internal mirror plane, it actually, even though it looks like it has two stereo centers, it actually, you can wind up with RS and SR being the same molecule. And that's what you got. Yeah. That's not what I was trying to test with this particular okay. um, question, um, which is why I tripped myself up trying to answer your question. Um, but for now, as when we're for this problem, we're trying to look at specifically comparing this and that. And so because we flipped one stereo center, but not the other, it's still diastereomer. Here, because we flipped both of them, trying to think of, well, let's, let's take our break. Let's come back at 10 after, and we'll talk about meso compounds, and then we'll get into energy. But that's the last stereochemistry related topic for today, like meso compounds. You can bear three with like cis and trans. What's that? Uh, like that one you were just talking about, the diaphora, I think. The left one is sick, the like right one is trans. Because, because I could take this and I could rotate it. Because it doesn't have a hindered rotation, um, we don't use cis and trans for these because they could be written in the same molecule and drawn with them to be opposite of each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to make there's a lot of different these ones on the left. We could definitely both of these are trans, but they're not the same molecule because they have the opposite orientation in terms of, of their stereocenters. 
if I took this molecule. So here's here's a good way. This will be how we tackle this since we already have been looking at those molecules. We'll use this the cyclobutane. You can even think of it kind of like a Punnett square from biology. There's, if you have two stereo centers, there's four possible ways to arrange them, right? And these two are mirror images of each other. These two are diastereomers because you flipped one of the centers and not, but not the other. These two are the same compound, just like you pointed out with the dichloro example. Because they have an internal mirror plane, they actually wind up being the same molecule. If I did something as simple as make it so it's not symmetrical now, now all of a sudden we have four distinct stereoisomers because we don't have that internal mirror flame anymore. So now this, that are mirror in, images of each other where, that aren't identical. Because if you took this one and tried to flip it to make it look like that one, your chlorine's in the wrong spot. And so that's why meso compounds are slightly different. And it's, it, they still have two stereo centers, but if they happen to have two stereo centers that are identical to each other, then with that mirror image, then we wind up with it being a little bit different. But I'll explain all that again. So take, take a break, so stop thinking about chemistry for a couple minutes, and then, then we'll come back. What was your name again? My name's Edward. Edward David. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. <laughs> I have a new question now. <laughs> okay. So let's pretend they're cyclohexanes, right? Okay. Um, if you draw their chair conformers, even though they're the same molecule, the one going in and the one going out, they right. do look different, right? Correct. Okay. So, but that's that's the difference between a conformer and an isomer. Yeah, I just always like I, I'm having a hard time like drawing those two differences. Yeah. Like, understanding which ones are axial, which ones equatorial is the one like coming towards you like does that indicate it's equatorial? the ones coming towards you will be equatorial okay that was okay that answers a lot right because then the, again the way that i always think about that is that the axials are always going to be in the plane of the board mm -hmm. straight up and straight down so if you place those then your equatorial has to be the last remaining position so it's easier to see the equatorial spots once you put the axials in there, because then you can just say, well, it's not axial, therefore it's equatorial. Gotcha. Makes sense? Yeah, I still have to practice, but yeah. yeah. Sometimes it helps if I follow my slides instead of going off the cuff to <laughs> answer answer related but out of out of order questions. You're pretty good following along with your slides, even though you're going off the cuff. It helps that that uh, y'all are asking the right questions in the right order as well. But that led to me getting to diastereomers before I defined diastereomers <laughs> by one slide. <laughs> All right, I need something to drink, so I'll run downstairs be right back.
curse. So if these enantiomers had the same substituents, would that be the diastereomer? That would, so enant enantiomers versus diastereomers, you always have, you're always talking about pair. So these two, these two are enantiomers, as are these two. Relative to each other, those are diastereomers. Oh, okay, I see. Because they're not the same molecule, but you also didn't flip both of the stereocenters. And, and so, and then one R2S with either of these is a diastereomer. Gotcha. One S2R with either of these is a diastereomer. One R2S and one S2R, because you flipped both of them, those are enantiomers. And so these are mirror images, and so are these relative to each other. Right. And it can be easier to see that one of the one of the ways to visualize these um, is so it's not entirely obvious that you switch the stereochemistry. It doesn't entirely look like they're mirror images. We picture taking this one R two S and doing the mirror image. Mirror image would look like if we we truly did a true mirror image where we draw everything to the same position but reversed. We all agree that's the mirror image of this one. You take that and flip it to put the OH in the same general spot with the stereo centers in the same space on the paper. We wind up the OH going down, and the methyl going down. So these two are the same molecule. Okay, but that is the mirror image. It's not super. Which is the enantiomer of this one. Yeah. Okay. Because the one, so if I tried to take this one and make it look like this one, I would want to put OH to the top right. And by doing that, I get OH to the top right, but into the board, not out of the board. Right, so anytime you can identify a stereo center and say, okay, well, two of the substituents are in the same spot here versus here, right? The the uh, the ring is in the same position, but I flipped my other two substituents. I swapped them. Anytime you swap two substituents, that's the same as take, doing the mirror image. So if you can look at this and say, okay, I had OH up and hydrogen down, 
And now everything's in the same position, but the OH is down and the hydrogen's up. That's a mirror image of that stereo center. If I take the mirror image of the oxygen stereo center, but not the methyl stereo center, it's not a mirror image. I flipped one of them, but not both of them. A mirror image, by definition, will flip both of them. Right, so that's your big, um, your big definition here is that if they're not mirror images, but they're still stereo isomers, they're still, you flip one of your stereo centers, but not the other, that's a diastereomer which spelled is behind the thing at the top there. Diastereo. As opposed to an enantiomer. Enantiomers are the mirror image. Diastereomers are not the same molecule, but also not enantiomers. Right, which gives us those four distinct types of isomers that we've talked about. Going back to the practice test. If I give you an isomer where the molecular formula is the same, it's, it has to be one of these four categories. It's either a constitutional isomer where you have the same molecular formula, but things are connected differently. It could, I can draw the same molecule in two different ways, and recognizing that can be tricky. Enantiomers and diastereomers are the new piece that we've added here. But every time I draw something like this, it has to be one of these four categories. It's just identifying which. And Go back to the other question here. If we had that same molecule from that practice test, we can take the mirror image of that. We can flip one of them, but not the other. Or we can switch the two that got flipped. These two are enantiomers because we switched both stereo centers. These two are diastereomers because we flipped one but not both. Which means these two are also diastereomers. You flipped one but not both. And the last piece of vocab around this is what we were getting at right before break, I guess the first part of break, is that these two, even though they look like enantiomers, because you have what's called an internal mirror plane, where you can draw a line across the molecule, and it's identical on both sides of the molecule, even though it looks like it has two stereo centers, Taking the mirror image of it gives you the same molecule. Because if I took this molecule and I flipped it like a pancake, I get this molecule. So if you have a, a case where you have two stereo centers, but also an interior line of symmetry, plane of symmetry technically, these two are not enantiomers, they're the same molecule. And that's called a meso compound. And so you, you have, can't just look at, and that's, that's a little bit like um, what I did with right here, number two here. This is not technically a meso compound because it only has one stereo center and it's actually, it doesn't have any stereo centers. centers. It's the same thing where I can show you the three-dimensional shape differently, 
and still have it be the same molecule because all I have to do to get from one to the other is a quick rotation. That's how you know it's the same molecule. All right, and the other place in the uh, practice in the test is going to be there's going to be a couple where, in addition to the naming, you don't have to name these. I just want you to tell me whether it's R versus S. That way I'm testing you just on that, not marking you down on your nomenclature specifically for forgetting it. Um, so find the stereo center, find the carbon that is attached to three set or to four unique substituents, assign priority, put number four away from you, and then draw your arrow. Right, so it's that same process every time. A lot of times the trickiest part is finding where the stereo center is, or is, is there a stereo center? Like right here, there isn't a stereo center. I just made it look like there was by using the wedges and the dashes. And then assign the priority. The other, and I, I am also guilty of making mistakes with this because I, this molecule here has a stereo center. At least one. Where are they? We're counting from the left. Yeah, carbon three right here is the stereo center because it's got an ethyl group, an isopropyl group, the rest of this big long chain, which would be a septentyl group, I think, technically. But again, not using that term at all. It doesn't matter. It's different than the other two. And then it has a hydrogen. So four different substituents attached to that carbon means that's a stereo center. But you can't assign R versus S here because I didn't give you enough information, right? I would need one of these three bonds to be either out of the board or into the board in order to do this. So I wasn't trying, to, I was just testing on whether or not you could do, you know, use basic prefixes when I wrote this question and I made it more complicated than I meant to by doing that. Are there any other stereo centers in here? Carbon four also has the same thing. Got a propyl group, a complicated propyl group, a methyl and a hydrogen. So this would be another one where if I gave you enough information, I could actually put it on that other problem. Are these two stereo or uh, enantiomers versus diastereomers versus the same molecule? But I would need to give you enough information about those two stereo centers. Can you go over uh, an example where we assign priority with a cyclic group? With a cyclic group, yeah. Let's let's look at uh, number two there. So let me redraw it on on PowerPoint because I like the pen better. <laughs> And just to make things interesting, let's make that one an oxygen. So it's not a meso compound anymore. Even if it's meso, you can still assign RR or RS or SS, whatever it is. You can still assign the priority and name it the same way. It just means it, that the mirror image of it would be the same molecule. But you do still have to pay attention to that because it could be RR versus SS could be mirror images, or they could be diastereomers, depending on if you have those two um, in there. But anyway, so drawing these, if you have a molecule with two stereo centers, especially if it's cyclic like this, the fact that if it's cyclic, that doesn't actually affect priority. We still use the same uh, procedure for figuring out um, what's going to be higher priority. So for this top, molecule, that's a hydrogen, or the top stereo center rather. We've got a hydrogen, a methyl, and both in two directions around the cycle. So which of these, we can still assign the lowest priority really easily, right? What's our lowest priority gonna be? It's gonna be the hydrogen. What's our second lowest priority going to be? No. 
cool. It's got to be the methyl because it's just one carbon attached to the rest of it. Both directions around the ring have more carbons. So when we're comparing these two to each other, going around all the way around the ring, back ending up back where you started, that's going to be the same for both of them, right? So for when it comes to assigning priority around a ring, it's the tiebreaker is always going to come down to where is everything else attached? Because I can go carbon and a carbon, and then 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 like it's an infinite tie, right? If you say, okay, you, you can start by following along the ring, but then you have to go a different direction at some point. Yeah. Going this way around the ring, we don't get to anything besides carbon until the fifth carbon, until the fifth carbon, right? And then we get to an oxygen versus if we started going this way around the ring, we had carbon, then immediately we can get up to an oxygen. And also the oxygens are tiebreaker. So it's the higher atomic number. So that means that this position would be priority one, this position would be priority two. And once you assign the priority, redraw it without the ring. And then it's the same as we've always done, right? You don't have to do that, but it makes rotating it around properly a lot trickier when you involve the ring structure, right? It's doable, but it's a lot harder to do mentally on a piece of paper. So this would push, you already look at which one. So I would put, I'm gonna just redraw it the way it is and then worry about rotating. And that's the other trick, yeah. is don't try to rotate and redraw at the same time. Right. So four is already to the back, so we don't need to do anything with that one. One, two, three. This is R. This, the top stereo center is R. So I'm gonna erase the priority and just write R on that. We can also do the same thing in practice with one, one below as well, right? I'll switch colors for that. So what's our highest priority and our lowest priority for the bottom stereo center? Highest is oxygen, lowest is hydrogen. Right, so we've got one, we've got four already into the board for us. That's gonna be that's gonna help us a lot with not having to rotate. And then the second highest would be going around the ring to the left. Correct. Sorry, counterclockwise. So now this, and again, you can redraw it, but if you don't have to rotate anything, if the hydrogen already happens to be in the back, you don't have to redraw it in this case. I redrew the other one just as, as practice, but because hydrogen, we already know the four is pointed away from us. We don't need to move anything. So we can just draw our arrow one, two, three. It's gonna be counterclockwise. So this stereo center is an S. How'd you get to the priority of two and three? So the same way we did before, we, if we're going around the ring, if we're just sticking to the ring, it's a tie no matter what, right? Going this way around the ring, you hit a methyl. Going this way around the ring, it takes you five carbons before you get to this to that methyl. Okay. So if you also think of it as you have to choose a different path the second time you do it, exactly. you have to do the hydrogen first and then right. methyl. Okay. So basically you look at what's different about the two things, and the differences are going to be what decide. And if you can't find a difference, then you don't actually have a stereo center, right? That's like with your ethyls on the on the practice test one. Yeah. If this didn't have another methyl there, then we would have no way of tie breaking, right? We have no way of tie breaking. It's because you have two identical substituents. And so, getting good at the priority and the tie break that actually answers a lot of the questions for you when you do this. If you just start. 
assign your priority, look at what's different. That's not a bad way to go about these type of questions. It's a little slower than just being able to see it and realize what's going on, but you're just not quite there yet. You're still learning this stuff. So that's, that's reasonable. Take your time to get it right. As far as the rest of the name for this molecule, when we have two stereo centers in the same molecule, we just put a number attached to each of them. So if this was cyclopentanol, uh, we haven't covered alcohols yet, but the OL indicates the oxygen here. So we'd say it's a methyl, methyl cyclopentanol, we put a one there and a two here, one methyl or two methyl, one cyclopentanol. But the interesting thing about this, the reason I'm naming this, even though we haven't covered alcohols yet, is what do we do with these? Uh, if this is carbon one, this is getting really far too messy. We would just say the carbon one is S and carbon two is R. So we'd say one S comma two R. If you were to break it up like putting the numbers inside, like if this was cyclopentin one all. Okay, yeah, you would say cyclopentin one all. Would the Rs be in there? No, we keep the the stereochemistry information is always at the very first. I I guess I should say, I've never seen it done. Um, what if you're using cis versus trans, or if you're using E versus Z, or if you're using R versus S, all of that information is always at the very front. All right, so there's some more practice with this. We'll, we'll start with this one. Um, this um, these ones are tricky because they're not, it's not obvious whether anything has switched R versus S in some of these, right? But because this one is rotated around differently, you can look at this stereo center and say, okay, well, that one seems like it got flipped. But did this stereo center, it's harder to see because we rotated everything. I believe that this one, that this one's flipped and the second one is not, which would make it a diastereomer. Mm -hmm. This one, both stereo centers got flipped, which makes it in an antiomer. And again, I know I did that quickly and sort of mentally. If you're not sure, assign the priority and figure out R versus R. And you know, this one is easy to look at and say, okay, I, that one definitely got flipped. So if this is R, that's S. For the second one where it's not obvious to see, actually assign, okay, that one's R, this one's also R. Once you do that, now you can say, okay, one flipped and one didn't, boom, smoking gun, diastereomers. And here's the, um, the explanation of meso compounds as well. So, pair of enantiomers. These two are not enantiomers because we have that internal mirror plane. If we switch one of these oxygens out for a methyl group, it's not meso anymore. So, meso compounds is just like a red herring, pretty much to basically. Me. Right. Just the same. Yes, nature is designed to confuse you. <laughs> no, it's a. They're in there. They need their own description because it seems like they should be enantiomers, and they're not. And the way we describe that is by having this additional term. So mathematically, all of these different transformations and mirror reflections and things like that can be actually represented mathematically by putting the coordinates of all of the atoms into a matrix and then applying different matrix algebra. Um, transforms our operations to them. They call them transforms. Um, like we mentioned before, and so 
if you happen to apply a mirror image transformation and you get the same thing back, that's how you know it's the same compound. And so mathematically, we can show that these are the same compound. Visually, we can look at these and say that they're the same compound. But we need a term to describe why these are not an anti immerse. So we use the term meso. All right. Um, we're going to leave that one alone for now. And let's talk about energy just a little bit for the 15 minutes we have left. So we talked a little bit about energy earlier. We've been using the term enthalpy. This, some of these are review slides um, from Gen Chem that we're gonna go through pretty quickly. So we're having a crash course on thermodynamics and then applying it to OCHEM. Um, one of our definitions of enthalpy is the energy required, and that shouldn't be delta H, Enthalpy, just H, is the amount of energy needed to break a covalent bond homolytically, meaning you, you split it back up into its atomic orbitals. So you wind up with one atom takes its electron and goes one way, the other atom takes its electron and goes the other way. You wind up with two free radicals, very unstable situation. Like a what? Sure, that works. <laughs> Basically, you just undo forming the bond. That's not how most bonds actually break. Um, sigma bonds between certain atoms can be broken just by, and any bond can be broken just by shining light on it. And the wavelength of light that you need to do that is H. If you, if you turn the H value into, um, into joules per atom instead of joules per mole and plug it into our original quantum equations for energy equals Planck's constant times frequency, you can calculate the frequency of light needed to break these apart. For most sigma bonds, that energy is well above the visible range, which is why you don't really start seeing health, health effects, um, um, negative health effects when it comes to light until you get to UV and beyond. Anything below that that might have enough energy to break some sigma bonds, in particular the halogens and oxygen-oxygen single bonds, so peroxides. Um, you can you can um, put just visible light in at the higher end of the spectrum, and that's enough to cleave those bonds homolytically and create free radicals. Um, but for the most part, we don't actually need to worry about about that happening, we use that as a tool to represent that. So here's some examples of some various bond association energies. So that would be that H that you need to put in to get it to split homolytically. Homolytically meaning we, we have two unpaired electrons as a result of it. Most bonds that actually break, and especially in organic chemistry and in um, biochemistry, we actually usually have a heterolytic bond cleavage. Because homolytic bond cleavage really only happens when you have the same atom on each side. If you have the same type of atom on both sides, then they both have the same equal electronegativity, right? If they have the same electronegativity, where do you decide who gets what electrons? Each one gets one electron. Mostly, most of the bonds that we see breaking, though, are actually heterolytic or um, the bonds are not the same atom on both sides, which means one of them is going to have more electronegativity than the other. Maybe a polar bond. So a polar bond. Most bonds are at least slightly polar. Even carbon-hydrogen bonds are slightly polar, right? And so you wind up with heterolytic bond cleavage where electrons go with whatever's more electronegative usually. Right, but the these homolytic bond cleavage, we can actually calculate these energies. So a hydrogen attached to another hydrogen has 535 kilojoules per mole. Hydrogen to a carbon, um, if it's a methane, it's a, also 535. But you can see how as you start adding other variables, those numbers change a little bit. All of those are high enough that the visible spectrum doesn't touch them until you start getting into things like a peroxide bond, which is in the 200 kilojoules per mole range, and chlorine-chlorine bond, or a bromine-bromine bond. Those are more in the range where you can start seeing um, 
these uh, homolytic bond cleavage due to visible light. And so what we actually look at for the most part in terms of bonds dissociation energy, I just got done telling you, we almost never see this actually happen. Most of the bonds that we'll actually see break are heterolytic. And so, but we can still estimate the change in enthalpy for a reaction by looking at what bonds are breaking, what bonds are forming. And that's how we get the enthalpy of reaction or the heat of reaction. Heat of reaction is basically if you add up all the bonds that you're breaking, you had to put in that much energy to get them all to break, right? And then at the other end, you subtract the amount of energy that you get back from new bonds being formed. So if you have all those bond association energies, even though you don't actually split those bonds homolytically, we can still use those values to estimate how much energy do we get out of this overall process. Even, even if it goes through a different pathway that's all heterolytic, we can still use the homolytic bond association energies to estimate that. It'd be like, it'd be like uh, estimating your change in elevation from here to Carson by going in a straight line versus taking a pass. Your overall change in elevation is the same regardless of if you go as the crow flies or if you go on the roads, right? The uh, homolytic bond association energy is like going in a straight line. Doesn't matter how high your barriers are, you're gonna go over them anyway because all we really care about is the start and the end. The way that the chemicals actually react is they go the, the path of least resistance which means they're gonna take the pass, even if it's a more complex pathway. All right, and so just to, to uh, reiterate some terms that we've used in the past, if delta H for a reaction is negative, we call that exothermic, it means it gives off heat to the surroundings. If delta H is positive, that's endothermic, because we're talking from the point of view of the chemicals. So if the chemicals lost energy, it had to go somewhere. So it goes to the surroundings, they get warm. If the chemicals gained energy, that energy had to come from somewhere, it came from the surroundings. So the surroundings can be measured as getting colder. So that's what we call them endothermic. You're putting heat in, endo means inside, exo means outside. All right, so we can actually use these bond association energies to predict delta H. The way we predicted delta H values in the past was by going to your delta H of formation values, right? Um, well, what if your table of delta H of formation values doesn't have, say, uh, methyl, methyl chloropropane on it? It was mostly inorganic stuff, right? And even if it had some organic stuff, it wasn't necessarily that specific. If we want to know an estimate for delta H for this reaction, we just look at what bonds did we break and what bonds did we form. So in order for this to happen, we had to break a carbon hydrogen bond, we had to break a chlorine chlorine bond, and we make a carbon chlorine bond, and we make an HCl bond. So two bonds breaking, two bonds forming. So, and it's always, this is the case where you have to pay attention to your sign a little bit. We're getting these energies back. These are downhill energies, we're forming them. We have to put these energies in, so they're positive. So if you keep track of that, I don't like to do, to think of it as final minus initial because that messes with the signs. It's always, if you're breaking a bond, that's positive energy because you have to put it in. If you're forming a bond, that's gonna be a negative because you're getting it out. So that carbon got 381, we have to put 381 kilojoules in, and we have to put in 243. It was right on the minus and then those halogens are right in that 200 kilojoules per mole range. And then we're gonna be minus 431, and minus 331. So it's overall negative. So delta H overall 
we just sum those numbers up and we get some, so that's 762, and that's gonna be 500, that's gonna be 600 something, right? So overall, it's gonna be a negative number, which makes this an exothermic reaction. And we just pulled out a calculator and actually calculated those numbers. We could put a number for delta H, but it's beside the point. The point we're just trying to make is that these bond that delta H is really best understood as the energy in these bonds. So it's a form of potential energy to use physics terms. It's bond, it's energy that can be released if you change the system a little bit. So you said this was endothermic? So this should be exothermic because it's our overall delta H when we add all these up, it's gonna be negative 762 plus 600 something. So negative is exothermic and positive is exothermic. Correct. Right. right. So overall, we're going to wind up with negative 140 kilojoules per mole. The number is not super. No, it's yeah, yeah it's no, it's just the, the sign. One side or the other. Right. That's good. Right. And so that's the way we're going to think about these things for the most part. I, I told everybody at the beginning. This is not a super math heavy class. All evidence to the contrary right here. This isn't tricky, right? This, the trickiest part of this is understanding the concepts and we're gonna deal mostly with the signs. Is this exothermic or endothermic? That's the, and cause that's gonna give you the right qualitative answers. Even if you could then, I, I have faith in everybody's ability to add these numbers up if you know the concepts, right? All right, so a couple more vocab terms. So spontaneous in general just means that reactions that naturally proceed that are downhill in energy, even if there's some barrier preventing them from proceeding. Like for instance, it would still, it's still spontaneous. If you put one atmospheric gas on the right-hand side and it's a vacuum on the other-hand side, it's spontaneous for this gas to spread out through both of these. But by having a barrier in between, we can stop it from happening. The process is still spontaneous. We're just, it has too much of a barrier for it to go through to actually have that happen unless the system changes. But it's still considered a spontaneous system. So it's spontaneous in chemistry does not mean it happens on its own necessarily. It means that once, uh, can't even phrase it that way. It means that um, the reaction is downhill in energy in a specific form of energy called Gibbs free energy, delta G. Right, and so there's some slides here that are looking at spontaneous processes. Um, the nail rusting is spontaneous. It's non-spontaneous. If, if a reaction is spontaneous one direction, it will always be non-spontaneous the other direction under standard conditions. That's the way we covered it in Gen Chem, right? That there's more to the story though, because we can take a rusty nail and actually turn it back to being an, a clean nail by changing the conditions such that we force equilibrium to go the other way, right? We can take this system and force the air back that way. We just have to change something about the system to do it by adding a vacuum pump um, that takes air out here and puts it in there. And then that is a way to cause it to become, to go in the non-spontaneous direction. So non-spontaneous doesn't mean it will never happen. It means under standard conditions. Because if we want to learn one thing from equilibrium, it's that every reaction happens a little bit, right? Even the non-spontaneous reactions happen a little bit. This might be insignificant within sig figs. And so really the difference between spontaneous and non-spontaneous is, is which side is favored at equilibrium under standard conditions. All right, and so we can actually get the derivation for this, um, for delta G, this is absolutes. I can speak in absolutes when it comes to the second law, for, to the laws of thermodynamics. For the second law of thermodynamics, 
for any irreversible, aka spontaneous, process, delta S, the entropy of the universe must increase. Otherwise, it's non-spontaneous. If a reaction is spontaneous, delta S of the universe is increasing. As to the why for that, that's kind of one of those, it's the way the universe behaves. It could be argued that that's, it's our brain's way of processing time, is understanding or our time is our brain's way of processing the second law of thermodynamics. The reason that you don't have the entropy of the universe decreasing is because that would be like looking backwards in time to see that. So time is sort of our brain's way of processing. It, it's more complicated than that because the math behind time is more than just another um, dimension, but you can think of it basically like time, time is our brain's way of measuring the entropy of the universe. Kind of an interesting way to think about it. So it's like a reference point where we first wrote this down was saying that this is the baseline of entropy right. of the universe. And, and, and the, is going. there's a logical, there's a logical um, progression where you could say, okay, there must be a beginning because there's a lowest possible entropy state for the amount of matter in the universe. You take all the matter in the universe and you force it into as close quarters as you possibly can, and it's all hydrogen atoms. There's really only one way to arrange it, which so that would be entropy of zero. And then the Big Bang happened and everything spread out from there. That's an increase in entropy because there's more disorder now. There's more possible arrangements. And we're just continually progressing from zero entropy at one point towards what they call the heat death of the universe, which would be maximum entropy. And what that actually looks like depends on if you assume the universe is infinite or not. Feels like there was a contradiction in there somewhere, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, we get into causality, but we did that right. last, last right. time. So, uh, so Boltzmann, Boltzmann was the first one who put who put numbers to this, and that's why it's Boltzmann's constant KV um, is actually his tomb is just has the equation for entropy on it. Um, I don't know if he didn't have family or if this was like they just decided this was the best way to remember him. Uh, he did commit suicide, so obviously not entirely mental well, and had a very nihilistic viewpoint. He was German, was a contemporary of um, of uh, Nietzsche. Um, so you could make the 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 leap to to assume that there's some that they knew each other personally, perhaps. Um, I don't know what the social scene and the intelligentsia of Germans in the late 1800s was, but it wouldn't surprise me if they knew each other, given their similar outlooks on life. Um, so how does entropy actually affect things we can measure? Well, we're out of time, so we're going to start talking about heat and thermodynamics in more detail and how it applies to you, um, starting from this slide, probably on Tuesday. And then Tuesday lab of next week will just be a review session. So we're going to finish the topic of thermodynamics and lecture, and you'll probably have questions about it. And so we'll go through those questions in the practice test um, on, in lab on Tuesday, and then the test will be Thursday. All right. Any questions before we adjourn for the weekend? And last lab was going to be due this Friday, tomorrow. Yes, the lab from last week will be due tomorrow. So you still have time to do that GC data to crunch those numbers. What was the W that was?